Yeah, by coincidence, actually, I, I studied in Palestine during the Arab revolutions, like in like winter, spring last year. And after that, I went to Egypt. So I kind of I've seen a bit. I got an impression of like the, the interrelation between the struggle for freedom in the Arab world and the struggle against the occupation in Palestine. And my main impression about Palestine was that the Arab revolutions were very contradictory for Palestinians. They were in a way, in a sense, painful also because they confronted them with, with the weak, weakness of their own struggle and with, with the contradictions in their own country because for a long time it has always been about like what about the knee, about national unity. And um, when they took the streets to show that, express their solidarity with Egyptians, they realized, I mean, of course they realized before, but they were like, more confronted with the fact that their regime was working against them and was like, doing everything to stop them from protesting in solidarity with Egyptians, uh, which so, showed, again, underlined the hypocrisy in Abu Mazen's regime. Um, and actually, it started from a very, on a very small level because, like the hunger strike that you mentioned, where seven of my fellow students basically at some time point just spontaneously decided, okay, khalas, we're going to sit down here, we're not going to eat anymore until something is solved. On a very like basic level, very vague political ideas, and they radicalized during the course of the hunger strike. Like the first protests were in the night, and like they really started beating us up, the authority. Then, um, when they started like beating people up in the night, suddenly like there were seven, like like four thousand people in the streets shouting, shouting also like a shabri, skatanisan, also the people wanted them for the regime, and um, so it shows like how people were, in Palestine were radicalizing against the authority, and at the same time you mentioned also Nakba Day, uh, like the 15th of May, and and, and the memorial of the, the uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestine. In Egypt, that was a really crucial factor. I think one of the first um, first moments where many Egyptians felt, okay, the army is not on our side, mm -hmm. because the army attacked people. The army, the army showed clearly that they are uh, uh, which side they're on. They're not like on the side of the Palestinians. So many, many Egyptians radicalized on Nakba Day. So there is kind of an interrelation between the strengths. Thanks, Mariam. It's really comprehensive detailed analysis. Two points. Um, one is concerns the situation in Egypt at the moment. You, at one point you referred to the continued closure of the border of Afa. And Egyptians have, in the last year have often talked about Egypt's shame, which is the fact that the Mubarak regime closed the border between Gaza and Egypt. Um, and it sort of echoes or complements the apartheid wall of the Israelis. And one of the demands of the movement you described in the summer around the, the, great, the march from Tahrir to the Egyptian embassy, to the Israeli embassy, was obviously to remove that, but it remains in place. It does remain in place. Uh, there's now uh, an Egyptian government with a Muslim Brotherhood majority, or an Islamist majority, uh, and there's no sign at the moment of that government opting to tackle the question of the Egyptian ex ex containment of the Palestinians. It doesn't appear to be on the agenda. I don't know to sit through, despite the fact that, the that, the, uh, that Hamas is the brother organization of the Ikhwan, you don't notice this being prioritized. And in fact, the Ikhwan leaders have given assurances to the Americans that they have to be trusted, in quotes, as far as Israel is concerned. I just wonder what your comments are about that. Secondly, just a quick thing about the general, the whole historic development of the Palestinian movement over the last 40 years is, in a sense, seems to me to be about Palestinians trying almost every means of struggle at their disposal, one after the other. In the early 50s, it was relying on the so called radical Egyptian regimes. They tried Nasser. Nasser says, oh, liberate Palestine. Palestinians say, okay, you know, we'll be on that. That doesn't work. Palestinians opting for guerrilla struggle, for reasons you explained at the beginning, phenomenally difficult, doesn't work. Um, Palestinians are orienting at various points of the Gulf regimes. Give us the money, that will provide us with the guns, that doesn't work. It's as if, and then, crucially, the intifadas. Mass mobilisation. Can we do it on our own by 
other means because of the reasons you described. And it's almost as if every political alternative available except the alternative of an organic relationship with the workers' movements of the region has been addressed. Has been and the reason that hasn't happened, it seems to me, is because enormous efforts put in by the Arab ruling classes and by the Palestinian leadership to prevent that relationship developing with the really potent political forces of the region. So people like Arafat and others try very, very hard to insulate Palestinian nationalism from the mass movements of the region. And the critical thing, critical question is, at this moment, have the efforts of the Arab ruling classes, particularly in the Gulf, and the Palestinians' own leadership, have they, is it possible that these efforts will not be sufficient to prevent the Palestinian uh, movement forging a real relationship with the Arab working class. Looking back with a histori you know, historically, with a type of broader um, uh, sweep, what's your feeling about that? Do you, do you think that at this point, that because of the exhaustion of these other options, that now that it's possible that this latest development might bear fruit? So I'm sorry, I'd rather labour that point. But what do you feel about that, the, the, this historic development? Well, it's a question about, uh, you talked a bit about the, the statehood bid. And I was wondering if you think, I mean at the time I was wondering um, how one of the deals in the bid was to say that the PLO as an organization that brings together both 4867 and the, and the diaspora would kind of be abandoned and would go back to, and, and that the representation would go to the PA in a Palestine only kind of body of representation. Do you think there was a, was there an element of trying to cut out the, the newly radicalized elements? I mean, you talked about, about the Syrians, for example, where the, the PFLP still has a, you know, credible base where they can still maybe organize to, 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 to some kind of extent, and, and a new radicalization in the demonstrations there linked to the, the, local, the local movements as well. Was there an attempt of, you talked about how you keep control and how, how, how Fatah kind of positions itself against Hamas and all of that, but is there also an element of how do you, do you push away in political representation inside of the Palestinian movement the kind of newly radicalized and, and politically dangerous elements of the, uh, of, of the diaspora? That's, that's one question. And then the second one was what you kind of mentioned about, at the end, about um, the, the, the movement inside of Israel that, that, that happened, and I, I know we talked about it uh, a couple of months back in one of those seminars here as well, and at the time I was kind of looking at it and trying to get my head around it quite a, quite a bit, because obviously we understand um, the, the kind of blunted possibility of, of movement and change inside, inside of Israel, and kind of as you said, that both the, the demands weren't really called on, on, on pulling out of the... Um, of the uh, of the military occupation, but kind of almost more worryingly, you thought, and certainly the right put the argument, you could also solve the problem the other way around. Why don't you expand free, cheap set, uh, housing in in the West Bank? Let's keep expanding and let's send all the youth over there. I mean, if you want cheap housing, we can we can we can keep building it in a kind of way. And so that there was a very worrying aspect to that, but that at the same time, it kind of reminded me of the of, of very similar movements around housing and around welfare at the end of the 70s, maybe in the first round of, 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 of neoliberalization inside of the Zionist project in which kind of the Zionist, the, the, the working classes inside of Israel are suddenly confronted with some kind of class differentiation inside of Israel, which, is, which they're really not used to and are always limited, and certainly now after the, the 90s and early 2000s that exists there, and in which, for example, Matt Spen, and again, I know Phil has, 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 has much more doubts on, on, Mas, on Matt Spen than, than, than I do, but Matt Spen really went into the movement and put an argument of saying we have to argue for, for the same, you know, that there are the old leaflets that kind of came out at the time about we have to ask for the same housing for Arabs and for Jews, we have to really put those arguments at the center of it, which obviously, A, was completely uh, inexistent this time because there is no left, however, un however credible or incredible inside of Israel. But also, what, is there then a possibility for that to emerge? Is there a possibility for, once again, the anti-Zionist movements in the Arab world or the revolutionary movements in the Arab world to find some form of, um, of, 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 person, of, of personal group to talk to 
inside of the Zionist entity, in a sense, which existed in however limited way in the late 60s and, and 70s, um, and, and, and certainly doesn't exist now. I mean, it's not an answer to anything you said, but I guess that's the... Uh, in terms of Palestinian, I mean, in terms of um, possibilities and Palestinian change in Palestinian politics and in pro-Palestinian politics uh, through the uh, revolution. I think it's really important that we always, in our analysis, separate between uh, the elite and the common people. Uh, and they're sometimes almost oppositional. Uh, so the choices by political parties or by representatives don't, just don't illustrate the dynamic. Uh, well enough, and we have seen that the Egyptian and Tunisian revolutions actually challenge that very logic that they don't even have to be uh, determined. So I think it's very important, and I think that I, I really think that Palestine, for uh, for most people in the region, if we talk about the common people, and we know they have potential power, remains uh, sort of an exceptional uh, case. I guess for a very logic reason that Palestine is. Still, it's a brutal colonial case in a so-called post-colonial era. I mean, I think that for every human being in the world, that is one of the main reasons why they are sympathetic, and let alone in the region where you share a history. Um, I think a, a friend of mine, a friend of mine, explained it as a Palestine as it's like an open scar on your face. Every day you see it, and you want to do something about it. It's 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 there. It's in your face. And of course, this is not the same as the Arab leaders and the calculations that are, are, are being done. Honestly, I don't think we should expect an awfully lot from the Muslim Brotherhood. They are prepared to sell out their own youth factions, <laughs> for crying out loud. Let alone, you know, some abstract notion of uh, solidarity because of sharing a kind of tendency uh, 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 with, uh, with Hamas. There's a lot of uh, internal... Uh, sacrifices that are happening between the Ikhwan uh, in, in, in Syria, in Egypt, in, uh, and the Hamas in, in, in Palestine. So I think I, we should not be surprised if they don't push the Palestinian cause uh, until they at least protected their uh, stability within the Egyptian uh, government. I think they do have a potential to be very pro-Palestinian. Uh, there is a genuine uh, less, uh, sense of that. We've seen the big mass demonstrations in January and February last year, where Palestine also, it wasn't fake, I don't think it was fake, I think it was really genuine uh, among the uh, uh, But I don't think we should be surprised if they sacrifice it. Uh, um, I think that in answer to your question about historical uh, sort of uh, uh, genealogy of Palestinian politics, um, I think the beginning of many of the problems started in the Cold War. Uh, when the political elites of the PLO uh, and or, or PLO cadres started to tie the Palestinian cause uh, more and more with the powers uh, uh, in question and powers that were not necessarily uh, uh, principally uh, interested in the Palestinian cause but had their own geopolitical interests. Um, it's very difficult for me to be very harsh about it because at the same time we also know that the Palestinians did not have that many choices. So sort of, uh, there is a debate within the Palestinian uh, left about how far you can go in sort of attacking the Palestinian, the former Palestinian leadership because, I mean, we know that materially speaking in terms of balance of power, it wasn't like they had a lot of choice. But I think we should be very uh, critical about they, what they did because I think, uh, especially when they later on began to ally themselves more and more with the petrol paying uh, uh, regimes, uh, that led to even more scandalous situations, even situations whereby Arafat had to publicly call, was actually ordered to give speeches uh, to other countries to tell them not to protest outside of Palestine, because that's what the regimes wanted. Um, basically saying thank you but go home. Uh, so it becomes more and more problematic and I think that state opportunism uh, meant that sort of the Palestinian cause became really, I mean, very subservient to these geopolitical uh, games and then so they were dumped 
uh, when they weren't useful anymore. So where the sort of new world order was announced in 91, uh, uh, that I think resulted in Oslo, because that's when I think uh, Arafat shifted from Moscow to Washington, and, and I think that sort of that is the context that explains uh, a certain uh, dynamic. And I think that, uh, as I said in the car on the way here, uh, uh, Syria is a very serious problematic example. Um, of course, we know that Syria critics know that Syria. Plays, uh, have, is very expert in playing uh, out different groups against each other. What they did in Lebanon in the Lebanese history is really very, very painful uh, in terms of the left and how it destroyed the left. Uh, but I mean, the practice of serving Palestinians basically uh, as a fig leaf, uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult. And I think the reason why a lot of people fall into that is because they have gotten so accustomed Despite a year of enormous change and revolutions, they've become so accustomed to the politics of defeat, the sense of defeatism. And if, I think that if you look at the streets and the, 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 the genuine sort of emotion and, and people's politics, they are much more radical than their governments. The average Syrian is much more pro-Palestinian and much more pro-resistant than its government. So where is this fatalism coming from? This idea that if the people take over the state of uh, Syria, then oh, there's no resistance. No, there will be more resistance. There will probably be better go coordinated. Effort. So it's this politic of uh, defeatism. And I really have to say that I think that sort of the shelling of homes, like uh, we've seen in the last 48 uh, hours, uh, as uh, the shelling of uh, Gaza, almost very similar, uh, in the name of supporting Palestine, uh, will not go down well in history. And Palestinian martyrs uh, would be would be deeply, deeply ashamed uh, to have their suffering being used to legitimize the suffering of the Syrians. Um, as I said, I think that's not even necessary. That's why I don't understand some of the people the radical pro-resistance left. Why are you so defeatist? So I think that it's, it's uh, not only relevant to say this on a humanistic level, uh, what do I say to a Syrian kid who had, was castrated by the, by the regime? Uh, you know, Palestine, it's, you know, what, what's your answer going to be on a humanistic level? But also strategically, it's not going to be very helpful for Palestine. That's why I fear what you're saying is relatively true. There's a lot of potential um, progressive radical change in the air with the Arab revolutions, but with what's happening in Syria and uh, connecting that to uh, Palestine might actually also lead to uh, a backlash. And I'm really worried about, uh, about that because you hear more and more people say, I cannot support Syrian protesters, protest because of uh, uh, Palestine. So I have this general resentment to this kind of knee-jerk uh, academic critique about, you know, like the, all the Arab revolutions, they're not revolutions, nothing has really changed, the system is still in place, you go and live in, uh, in Egypt without mobile, I can't come back and tell me whether nothing has changed. But after yesterday, I really have, I mean, I have to say this, but I, I only have contempt for the so-called pro-resistance opinion that you can't sort of, uh, support one revolution, uh, but you can the other uh, in terms of geopolitical uh, power balance, and actually then representing those uprisings as imperialist plots. And I hear echoes of June 2009 about the Green Revolution and, uh, and uh, the Green Revolution uh, protesters in, in Iran as being agents of imperialism. We are all pro-resistance. We really don't have to be very radical. Uh, uh, for that. So I think, I mean, fatalism is rarely good, but I think uh, idiocy never is uh, good. So that's all I can say about that. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the Israeli protests, I think, unfortunately, the Israelis are very united in their hate for the Palestinians. So even internal racism, which is real, I was recently at a conference uh, and there was a paper on racism in Israel. It's really, really serious. I mean, it's not nice to be Moroccan in Holland. Uh, you're a Kant Moroccan, that's uh, our that's the quote for Moroccans. But it's not nice to be a Moroccan in Israel either, or to be an Ethiopian uh, uh, Jew. 
but uh, that's, I think, the, uh, the legacy of Zionism. Um, and I, I mean, for me, uh, reading the writings of Tony Clear has taught me a lot on, on understanding this, so, this apparent paradox, but actually it's not a paradox. And it reminds me a lot of uh, uh, the Pied Noir in Algeria. There's not so much written about it, or it's not really discussed. I mean, Palestine is much more known, but also this sort of the set. It's kind of settler, uh, the difference between central, settler colonialism and colonialism. Um, now, I think that would be an interesting uh, comparison as well. So I don't think we have all of much to expect from the Israeli uh, left. But I'm not, I think we should be wary not to be sectarian. Uh, I had quite some heavy discussions with comrades uh, last year uh, about you know, like this kind of tendency to be all out negative. There will never be change. They will always, I'm always like, we shouldn't be that sectarian. Uh, for opportunistic reasons. Whenever there's an opening, try to uh, uh, ex exploit it. So if there are mass protests and if Palestinians are joining those protests, who am I to tell those Palestinians that they are stupid, that they shouldn't do that? First of all, I would like now to double your voice about <coughs> Syria. And as you said correctly, uh, it just kind of reminded so much of like 2009. It is true that Syrian situation, as Iran was, is a contradictory situation and there is a kind of coalition of different forces in play. But at the same time, it is so much kind of residue, uh, residue of the kind of Cold War, uh, thinking at, ter uh, at the level of big politics, thinking in terms of uh, geopolitical politics rather than kind of empowerment of people from below. But in terms of Palestine, actually that's even a lie. I mean, one of the reasons that Israelis were so worried about the Syrian uprising at the beginning I am sure that something has happened in the last year. I'm sure that uh, kind of the, uh, imperialism has found some more reactionary aspects within Syrian uh, kind of forces in order to be able to negotiate with them. Because at the beginning, one of the very, very significant images which came out of Syria was people attacked a hospital and a school which was called mm -hmm. Hafez Assad. They brought it down and they called it uh, Golan Heights. Yeah? Yeah. And in a sense, there was so much uh, because Palestinian kind of refugees in Syria joined the, kind of joined the movement of the, there as well. And that's why, in a sense, at the beginning, they were depicting the Syrian uprising and the forces inside it, Salafi, etc., as these crazy Islamists who, if they get the power, they want to attack Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why, at the beginning, the Western media was not very, very fond of it. I mean, it seems that, okay, they might have kind of found, uh, found uh, more uh, kind of clo closer, kind of more pro Western elements within the Syrian uprising, but that doesn't mean that the, the kind of what was happening there, uh, we have to condemn it at all. Yeah? This is one thing. The second thing is, uh, I know when you said uh, the military option is not correct, but in order to kind of have a slightly more wholesome image of the situation, I think we should somehow remember the two very recent uh, military episodes between Israel and kind of the region. One is 2006, the, the, the war with Lebanon, and the other one 2008. And I would like to note how Palestinian kind of basically collective consciousness understood and kind of absorbed these two, these two kind of episodes. Because in a sense, in the first one, Israel, though it is the force, the strongest military force in the world, didn't win against uh, a, kind of a non-classical army, i.e. Hezbollah. And the second thing is like 2008. I would like to know what was the kind of reaction of part of the kind of Palestinian land being completely destroyed in like uh, 23 days, etc. I mean, how did the West Bank understood that? And what was the reaction towards, towards kind of Palestinian authority? The other thing is, uh, you didn't mention so much about Hamas. I mean, you kind of, I think you more, more kind of focused on Palestinian authority. <coughs> what was happening with kind of Hamas and what's happening with the country, again, with Palestinian opinion about something which was in resistance and then went to a state? And we know that when uh, opposition forces, or kind of at least, how resistant forces go to a state, they have to compromise, and, and Hamas has compromised massively. The, uh, Mona mentioned the fact that Palestinian authorities uh, kind of attacked demonstrations uh, in solidarity with Egyptians last year, but I remember, I've seen like, YouTube of Hamas being even kind of more brutal uh, kind of attack on pro-Egyptian demonstrations last year. I mean, Hamas is not a Hamas which was like pre, before joining, joining the government, becoming the state. And now on the final thing, at the geopolitical level, I mean, it seems that we are having some, some changes. 
and some I, th I think it's just only for good. I mean, so what happened since 2011, since Tunisian anti-Israel revolution, it will have significant uh, consequences for, for Palestinians. Because until now, we had pro-Western puppets or kind of pro-Western uh, governments from Mubarak to Ben Ali and other governments who would, if there was a war, they would close down the channels of help to Palestinians and they would kind of basically uh, dabble and assist Israelis. Or, alternatively, we had crazy uh, dictators who would try to appropriate the Palestinian cause in their own names. Famously, Saddam became the biggest kind of pro-Palestinian after, uh, after the First World War. Then you have kind of Gaddafi. Whenever kind of they, have the, they have the threat and danger, they become kind of the pioneers of Palestinian, Palestinian cause. Interesting, even Mubarak called people on the streets Israeli agents, yeah? Mossad agents. And so between kind of pro-Western pro puppets and, and the kind of crazies who are trying to appropriate, now we are hearing a different voice. We are hearing the, the voice of people who are not going on demonstrations like in Iran, in a kind of state orchestrated demonstration. They are going there because they kind of believe. And that sense of solidarity is going to be very, very, very different from what we've seen in, kind of pro, pro, in, in, in the states supporting, in the kind of regional states supporting Palestine. And, and in a sense, again, there as well, at the level of an elite of these kind of new governments, is going to be a, a shift and change. If until now, for example, Hamas was trying to seek alliance with Iran, etc. Uh, now it seems that at least those governments who are coming from Muslim Brotherhood background, they're all seeing the model, at least they're confessing the model to be Turkey. I mean, from Khaled Mash'al in 2007, I think, he said, our model is not Iran, our model is Turkey. And actually, of course, the Western media never reported on that. But until, um, um, until now, you hear from, from Egypt, you hear from Tunisia, all of them are saying Turkey. Which means that we are, okay, going to have some ideological Islam, but we are not going to touch economy. What does it mean for Palestine, which is like one of the poorest countries in the world? What does it mean? If these people are not going to touch the neoliberal policies of Turkish government, the AKP, yeah? uh, what, what does it mean? Which hope does it bring to Palestinians? Yeah? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Because Hamas, Hamas says we are going to Turkey. If we are going to be Turkey. What does it mean? I mean, how can they still mobilize masses with that level of poverty if they are not going to like address the question of social uh, justice at all. Yeah, I wanted to pick up something that Phil said in his <coughs> comment. And, and firstly, I mean, I think um, Miriam's talk was, was brilliant. Was very, was very, very good at, at dealing with all of these questions. Um, but I wanted to come to the question of what is it that the NAPA was about? Why is it that the question of Palestine is so written into every fibre of what it means to be living in the Middle East and an Arab society in the way it is. And I think it's because actually what happened in May 1948 was precisely about breaking the momentum of revolutionary unity that was being created by mass movements, mass popular movements, at the heart of which was the workers' movement in Egypt at the time and, and in a number of other places, but much broader than that, in the, 19, in the 1940s. Um, and it is very precisely about that. It is, you mentioned the deflective permanent revolution. I don't think we've properly integrated that, um, our understanding of what Palestine, what the NAPA means for the process of deflective permanent revolution, because it's an integral part of it. And I mean, I'll explain what I mean by that, because if you look at the point at which the NAPA takes place, or at any rate, at the, the point at which the State of Israel is proclaimed, and you actually have the, consoli you know, the, 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 the consolidation of the Zionist state um, in, from, you know, from launched in, in May. This took place in a moment of intense revolutionary crisis in the region, which is now is only matched by the events of this year. And this year, of last year, 2011, surpassed it, but up until then it was one of the, one of the high points, really, of struggle from below. Mm -hmm. The Iraqi regime had just been shaken and practically overthrown by a popular uprising that took place in January that had forced the um, Iraqi government to repudiate the Treaty of Portsmouth, which it had signed with the British. The Egyptian monarchy was under massive uh, threat from below. There was a police strike going on where you had striking policemen in Egypt surrounded by the army, striking policemen with their arms, with their bayonets, with, with loaves of bread on their bayonets, demanding social justice and being supported by massive demonstrations in the streets of Cairo and Alexandria. 
you had, you know, this was after already a couple of years worth of massive protests in other countries, of the beginnings of the, uh, you know, the mobilizations in North Africa. The region was aflame with these huge movements from below. And I think that the, the, t the point about the, the w a way to understand the meaning of the Nakba is that it's about, it's a joint venture essentially between the nascent Israeli state, mm -hmm. the Arab regimes of the time, and the imperialist powers in order to break that, mo that momentum of, of revolutionary unity from below. They all may have had conflicting um, and sometimes counterposed interests in this, but it was about defending their combined interests. The Arab, the Arab monarchies were absolutely cynical about their use of, the, of, of going into Palestine, sending the standing armies into Palestine, when they had already sold the Palestinians down the river and allowed, you know, the, and allowed the ethnic cleansing to take place. Um, but they sent, in the, they sent in troops as a way deliberately to try and deflect people from the protests that were taking place on the streets of Cairo and, and, in, and, in, and in Baghdad. And that process fed directly into the disillusionment of the armies and the radicalisation of people like Gamal Abdel Nasser and so on. Um, and you know, that, that's, because it is so directly tied up with that process of breaking what was the real, the, the, the potential alternative that was developing from below at the time, um, that's why no one can escape from it today, I think. And that's why the Brotherhood, I totally agree with you about the Brotherhood, it's that they, they are trapped in, in this position where they're under pressure from, from above, and that they have to defend the interests of the, of, of the US unless they're going to confront the military regime, which they said they won't. So they're trapped. But they're also under huge pressure from below. And this is, again, why every, every street mobilization where this, where this happens, it comes up time and time, and time again. And you know, I think, I think understanding, understanding that is an important way of, of seeing, as I totally agree with you, that it's wrapped up in the process of permanent revolution in the region. And that we have, I agree, a very long way to go. But I'm also, I totally agree with you in terms of rejecting any kind of fatalistic notion and completely rejecting the perspective that saw um, the fake attempts of Arab rulers to use Palestine for their, for their own ends. And that they have, if we don't have faith that ordinary people can change this this time, then we're making the same mistake that people did all those years ago. Um, two quick points. Firstly, I think we shouldn't underestimate that there have been tensions in Israeli society already for a couple of years. It was really good that you mentioned 2006 and 2008, because I think in a sense, I mean, we shouldn't forget that um, the war in Lebanon was for, for Israel was, was a massive defeat, actually, and the humiliation that they were with their, all their money that they had and this massive army weren't able to defeat as well. I mean, it's embarrassing for them, but it also illustrated that it, like, it, it led to frustration in the Israeli society and anger. Of course, it wasn't directly rated against the Zionist state. It was more like, hey, why are you doing We have to die. Like, and it usually was so easy to kill people. <laughs> But um, I think that um, 2008 is in a way like a direct, like, like the massacre in Gaza is a direct like, consequence of the, the defeat in 2006. And just that, that's what I wanted to say is like the, the tensions are growing in Israel. It doesn't mean that it's overthrown immediately, but there is already a contradiction which is taking place for a while. Um, as for um, the situation in Palestine, like the debate that I often had with people is. Um, they had, in a way, like a really weird stages, stages understanding of of change. In a way that they said, like many political activists said to me, like, okay, first we have to deal with, like, we, we talked about the Palestinian Authority, and then they said, okay, first we have to get rid of the ihtilal of the um, occupation, and then we can talk about political freedom and everything. But I don't think that political change happened in kind of neat stages where you can say, okay, this job is done, this we can check that from our to do list. Uh, no, of course not. Like, I mean, the two struggles go hand in hand, and you can only get rid of 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 your um, of the political uh, Palestinian Authority by dealing with the occupation and the other way around. It's, it's kind of interrelated. Uh, uh, you touched a little bit about again going to the uh, the social movement and in Israel. And stuff. And you touched a little bit about the uh, Palestinian 48 participation in, in, in that moment. 
Um, I mean, I was under the impression that people didn't generally participate in it, and where they did actually participate in some kind of movement, it was a separate thing. Mm -hmm. So they didn't, because they also integrally saw that what they were demanding was is it in, is different mm -hmm. to what the Israeli society in general was demanding. Um, I don't really know much, so I'll just elaborate a little bit about in, in, in what sense did they participate? Because I was under the impression that they didn't really participate, mm -hmm. and because it was. I mean, if we talk about apartheid and all that internally in Israel, so it also turned up to those kind of movements. Um, so yeah, just sure. Yes, so I just wanted to respond to size <laughs> invitation. Um, I think let the Israelis, uh, Israeli activists, and let a potential uh, potential constituency of Israelis who mobilise effectively, collectively, in relation to Palestine, surprise the Palestinians and us. Let it happen. Um, but Israelis on the left are pretty much in despair at this point. And, well, it's not just for us to look at Israel from here and say, good heavens, how, what a dreadful situation, what a vacuum. But Israelis are pretty much in despair. I would be very happy to do it. Maybe we should organize a meeting at which some Israeli friends discuss this issue with more, perhaps more detailed knowledge than we have. But the, the Israeli Marxists, with whom I'm familiar, and there are a very tiny number of them, uh, are pretty much in despair. And many of them in the last 10 years met you know, there were never very many to start with. A significant number of left Israel well. because they were, they felt that, they felt paralysed. Um, and when you mention Matt's pen, um, the interesting thing about Matt's pen is that it was an organisation which raised very interesting issues in the late 60s and early 70s, but it couldn't sustain itself. It couldn't sustain its momentum, and it imploded. And the people who had the experience of Matt's pen and who still see themselves as revolutionary socialist Marxists, people who have a profound connection, association with the Palestinians and want to see change in Palestine, uh, make the point that Matt's pen couldn't maintain its existence because it never had an identity independent of left wing Zionism and was sucked back into in effect, towards the mainstream of Zionism. Uh, in this very, uh, this is a subject for another discussion, really, but just two more quick points about this. We had a meeting uh, called by BRICA, which is the academic boycott element of the uh, BDS movement in Britain, which met just across the other side from here in the uh, Khalidi, or downstairs, isn't it? Khalidi Lecture Theatre, in which Gideon Levy who was a very courageous Israeli journalist, mm -hmm. said, this is a couple of years ago, he said, don't underestimate, and he's by no means a, mm -hmm. uh, a revolutionary, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a radical journalist, but he said, don't underestimate how bad it is for us in Israel. He said, I've stopped writing for the Israeli audience. He said, I write for a, an a audience overseas and I write for posterity. Mm -hmm. And that's an extraordinary thing. He's not going to leave. He's not. He's not actually getting up and leaving as well. He says, "This is. I'm from Palestine. That's where I'm staying." Final point is that I don't think that having said all those things, I don't think it's the case that Israeli society can't change. It can change, um, but it's, what it requires is a demonstration of intent in the region in relation to Palestine, which can persuade some Israelis that they have a stake in a different order. Now, I think Israelis demonstrate this in different ways. Something very interesting happened in the last couple of years. A really significant number of Israelis who are entitled to non-Israeli passports acquired them. Like, it's a really significant proportion of all Israelis. I, can't, I, I might be wrong about this, but like 10% of people or more who, could, who are entitled to get a British or a German or a whatever it is passport I love for this. And this isn't just to go on holidays by all accounts. Some Israelis will leave when the pressure rises. 
Some can't or won't. But in that section of the population, the critical question is, what's the alternative being offered by the Egyptian movement, for example? Uh, I don't believe for a minute that radical Egyptians want to engage in some form of conflict which takes the lives of large numbers of Israeli Jews. It's not the agenda. And this has been demonstrated. I mean, one of the key things to come out of the Egyptian movement is the unity, the rejection of the invitation to absorb sectarian difference, part of the agenda. And I think the radical tone of the movement in Egypt can accommodate and accept and come to terms with a, you know, going back to the old slogan, a democratic secular Palestine, a one-state solution. And the question is how powerful, how powerfully can that alternative be put to, to Israelis? Because some of them, I mean, maybe through insights from, from other people here, I mean, Raya, maybe you have something to say about this, but my observation is that for some of those people, it will make perfect sense. Okay, uh, uh, on the, uh, I mean, thank you, by the way, all very much, I thought, and Ali, and, uh, and I learned a lot from your comments, uh, and the sort of Syria-Iran link, I think, is, is, is very important. Uh, I think they sort of, if you want to know what created a real shift, uh, that it was May 2000, uh, when Lebanon kicked out the Israelis from South Lebanon, and that was in May, six months later, the Palestinian Intifada broke out. I think that moment was far more important um, than 2006 or 2008 on the level of actually grassroots sort of internalization of the potentiality of, 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 uh, of uh, successfully resisting Israel. It didn't happen for a long time until uh, <coughs> then. So the symbolism of May 2000, I think, is, is very important. Um, I mean, you ask what the implications of, were of 2006 and 2008. Of course, first of all, uh, the implications were uh, extreme devastation and, uh, and uh, just brutal oppression. And a lot of people suffered from that. And that's part of the the way they think about it and, and, and look at it in the first place. In terms of 2008, I think the traumatic uh, ramification came a year later when the um, and when it turned out that uh, I think this, this was around, this was before the Palestine uh, papers. Um, I happened to have been there for field work, but there were some leaks showing that the PA was actually aware of the plans uh, that were being taken. Uh, the preparation for cast lead, and that they actually uh, also, I think there were even recordings, I'm not sure, but I think there were even recordings of some of the leaders saying, you know, we, that it confirmed that they knew and that it was being planned, and it was being seen as basically getting rid of uh, Hamas, and that the, the price being paid for it of uh, innocent people uh, was basically accepted. So, also, um, if you remember, the Goldstone affair, I mean, when the Goldstone report came out and there was going to be a vote, uh, it was the PA who uh, sort of played a role in, in not voting for it. Uh, there were all kinds of things happening on the, in the backstage, uh, I think even to the extent of getting um, uh, uh, um, uh, deals uh, from the Israelis to open new met mobile network uh, in, in, in Palestine. So I mean in that sense, uh, apart from uh, also the sort of positive uh, implications that it showed that they were not going to be defeated, that they were you know, sort of the embodiment of the uh, expression of I'd rather die standing than uh, on my knees, uh, it also had these other darker sides, uh, the, the, the understanding how deep the collaboration of the PA went in these uh, affairs, which of course, whether you like the PA or not, it does have a very uh, depressive, <coughs> depressive impact on, on, on common people. So I think that, that is very important to say about those uh, two periods. What, the, uh, what about Hamas? I think that still Hamas, uh, I mean, unlike what is called indigenous collaboration, this is what critics have now uh, 
been calling the PA, particularly Fatah or, or, or Abbas, is a bunch of Fatah. Um, so unlike this indigenous collaboration, uh, and also uh, uh, <coughs> because it did not cease for a long time to uh, use military resistance. Although most other parties succumbed to that wish, but the Hamas was one of the very few that refused. Although truth be said, it's not only Hamas. It, I mean, uh, also uh, factions within Fatah and, and the remnants of the, the left, they were also part of military uh, resistance. So, unlike the diff these, difference, uh, these differences, Hamas uh, is, has also been increasingly uh, discredited. Um, uh, specifically because of, we're paying lip service uh, to the cause while actually putting the conflict with Fatah uh, uh, above the collective interest. <coughs> it became party politics rather than uh, resistance politics or harakat, uh, whatever. Uh, and I think that that is what I refer to, uh, the trauma that people felt, that this schism, this split. So even for Hamas, it turned out to be more important who won which bit uh, than uh, the collective. Um, the impact of Turkey, I think it's a good question. And I mean, I, I, you already answered part of it, and I think it's very important. But then again, that's why this is not permanent revolution. And none of these actors are, are representing uh, the keys to permanent revolution because it is true, they are bourgeois parties. They, if, I mean, a lot of these uh, um, uh, Islamist parties have very neoliberal uh, politics and that's why I don't see them as uh, uh, the solution. And the only uh, uh, dynamic that can change that, uh, it's the very dynamic that we're seeing in Tunisia and Egypt, which is, uh, I, I guess, the protest from below. I think uh, Anne gave a really brilliant contribution. I, I hope you're going to write a piece <laughs> about this link between the Nakba and uh, historically and contemporarily. Uh, but I think it's also uh, wrapped up in a very simple historical fact, and that is the fact that we should not forget the region, especially the Levant, uh, has been divided and cut and pasted and I don't know what in the most artificial uh, way ever and this was very fresh at the time of the Nakba. I mean, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, Syria, I mean, they were, this was like one entity. So the sense of what the Nakba meant for different people, it was also really, we're talking about a period where it was still really not at all common to think in terms of strict divided nation states. These were carved uh, countries. So this, it's not romantic to say, you know, there is a shared collective identity. It really is uh, the case that for uh, uh, a long time that, that was the case. And I think that 48, it was still very fresh. I guess 48 was also the time when the carving up really mm. uh, became uh, materialized. Um, I, I must say that uh, I do sympathize with Palestinians who participate in the movement uh, uh, with the attempt to intervene. I mean, there are, it's a small group, I agree with you, but what they do is that they're saying that we don't want to be on the sidelines, we want to try and intervene. Although chances are very low we're going to make uh, any uh, progress. So I sympathize with that, but I also do not have any uh, critique against those who refuse to, because it's so simple. I mean, as I said, a racist uh, society reproduces a, a racist uh, movement. So, to come back to the Israeli left, I think that the the core issue is the Israeli left is Zionist. That's just it's a paradox that you cannot uh, 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 maintain. Uh, uh, maintain, and that's why also many of the radical uh, left uh, left. <laughs> and isn't this the founding member also of uh, this organization? I guess, you know, like, what is the point of staying as five revolutionaries in a, in a uh, settler uh, 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 colony? So they themselves have no faith in the internal factor. Uh, so who are we to actually have uh, more faith than the Israeli radical left in the internal factor of uh, change? But they actually refer to the international force. This is why I was starting with the whole point about 
uh, how imperialism and permanent uh, revolution are connected. And I think this is true. I mean, uh, the, the, so the solution uh, must be sought for in the international uh, factor. I really think that we also, in terms of countering the discourse and the dominance of the Israeli discourse, we, we, we must flip this debate and look at it from the Arab point of view of finding a key for the solution of uh, Palestine in combination with international uh, protest, our role. So this combination is much more uh, 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 relevant and, and important, uh, and in that sense you can uh, learn lessons from South Africa, where it was also a combination of the international global movement basically against apartheid and internal pressure, uh, fights, ANC, Communist Party, what have you. I think this is much more fascinating and inspiring to look at uh, then uh, the m slight potential probability of there being some kind of uh, factor of change in the Israeli uh, society, simply because also of the statistics. Uh, I'm not a positivist, but I mean, if you know that, you know, 3% <laughs> it or something like that, what, what is the solution? So I think that uh, I would just want to end with that and, and just bring back w what this was all about, right? This whole series was about the Arab revolutions and I think what it did is it brought back sort of the idea of mass people power uh, to the political compass and this was lacking in our political compass uh, uh, and I think that should be uh, our guideline, that should be our uh, uh, focus. Um, and I want to end with a quote from Palestinian um, I thought that was very moving uh, uh, from Palestinians to the Arab revolutions. Like the Palestinian community um, uh, network uh, uh, had a statement when the Tunisians went to the streets and they said, we pay homage and uh, reciprocate the unequivocal and crucial support of the Tunisian people in the Palestinian struggle for freedom, dignity and equality. The courageous Tunisian people have shown us the way. They have proven once again that even in the darkest of circumstances, hope remains. And Bugby, who you probably also all know, sent the following message to the Egyptians, when the Egyptians uh, were roiling. Your struggle is ours, as ours is yours. Your freedom is ours, as ours is yours. And I think this sort of reflects this very deep sentiment, I think, of unity. It's a unity of history and unity of destiny, basically. It's this combination, and I think that we must really, uh, uh, you know, rea realize that the cards are seriously reshuffled in the in the region, and there lies the solution for the for Palestine. I think the resilience, of course, of Palestinians is remarkable. We always uh, say that it's remarkable. I really think, I don't want to be one of those predicting, uh, you know, but I'm happy this is recorded so I can <laughs> refer back to it. It's a matter of time for the third intifada, to be honest. Uh, I think it, it's going to be a combination of Palestinians inside Israel and, and, and uh, outside. But if the intifada breaks out, it's going to break out in... Uh, uh, in uh, amid a regional uprising, and I think we are facing in reality <coughs> different than any reality before if you bring the two together, and I think that's why uh, the relation between Palestine and, and the Arab revolutions are, are more than just the historical relevance, but even Intifada breaks out in the current uh, conditions, uh, this will be uh, uh, unseen, and I think let's just get a lot of hope and inspiration out of that potential. <laughs> Thank you, Maria.